Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist and the Voice of Compliance, and I'd like to welcome you to the podcast, Everything Compliance. Everything Compliance is the only roundtable podcast in compliance with five of the top compliance commentators. The Everything Compliance gang includes Mike Volkoff, founder of the Volkoff Law Group, Matt Kelly, the coolest guy in compliance, the founder and publisher of Radical Compliance, Jay Rosen, Mr. Monitors with Affiliated Monitors, Sarah Haddon, the publisher and owner of Corporate Compliance Insights, and Jonathan Armstrong, partner at Quartery Compliance in London. In each episode, we take a look at various topics of interest in the compliance arena. We also have shouts and rants at the end of each episode. I know you will enjoy it. In this episode, Jonathan Armstrong talks about the recent proposed fines and penalties by the ICO in the United Kingdom against British Airways and Marriott for data breaches under GDPR. Matt Kelly considers some of the compliance lessons from the detention Trump administration detention camps on the border of the U.S. and Mexico. Mike Volkoff looks at the new Department of Justice evaluation of corporate compliance programs and criminal antitrust investigations guidance document. Jay Rosen asks, what are the benefits of independent integrity monitoring to states, local governments, counties, and regulatory bodies. Sarah Haddon has now owned Corporate Compliance Insights for six months, so she gives us some of her observations in her first six months as not only owner, but the publisher of CCI. Everything Compliance is a part of the Compliance Podcast Network and now a proud member of C-Suite Radio. Jonathan Armstrong, it sure looks like uh, sitting here in Houston that the ICO has bared its teeth over the past couple of weeks. Uh, what are you seeing in the world of data privacy slash data protection enforcement in your United Kingdom? Well, you're right, uh, Tom. It's been a busy couple of weeks, probably the busiest couple of weeks for uh, data protection and stuff GDPR over in the UK, and and indeed there's some interesting cases in in wider Europe as well. As we record this, the uh, UK Information Commissioner has just uh, it, uh, concluded quite a large case about uh, against an estate agent. Who knew that they didn't take proper care of data? But the two that I think it's causing the most headlines are the notices of intention to fine BA and Marriott, which came uh, out effectively consecutive days. Now, it's important to stress that they are notices of intent to fine. They are not yet fines. But there's an interesting intersection with compliance here in that both organizations seem to have taken the view that because the fines were so impactful, they had to report the notice of intention to fine to their respective stock exchanges. And as a result, both cases have come into the public domain. Now, as the estate agency case tells us this morning, usually there is a window between the notice of intent to fine, which is a private thing that normally isn't public, and, and the fine itself. So we know that there are a number of other notices of intent kicking about and I think we know that these two aren't the only big uh, potential fines that are on the radar. And having said all of that, the BA case, I think, is uh, pretty interesting. It comes after a data breach which involved, um, it seems, shopping cart software. So when people decided that they wanted to fly with BA, they went to an area of the site that took their payment details, and it seems that this part of the website was compromised. And hard and fast details of this are pretty scarce at the moment, as I say, because it's only the notice of intent is in the public domain, but not the ICO's rationale. But uh, it may even involve a breach of a third-party subcontractor. And obviously, under GDPR, there's an obligation on data controllers, those who are the boss the boss men of data, if you like, to uh, control those who work for them, who are, who are technically called data processors. 
So here, the uh, Information Commissioner has announced that she intends to fine BA 183 million sterling. So obviously, the exchange rate is a movable feast at the moment, but somewhere north of 200 million US dollars. And as I said, it uh, it relates to a cyber incident. It is an attack on their website, and the personal data of 500,000 people was compromised in that attack. And the ICO effectively said that this was a known vulnerability on in this particular so- type of software, and that BA should have taken care. Now, BA's position, of course, is that this was a criminal act. Somebody had a go at their website and stole stuff. And BA say that nobody has come to harm as a result. It's fair to say that that is disputed by some people. And obviously, this isn't the first fine uh, for a data breach under GDPR. But uh, if the fine crystallizes, it's certainly the biggest What will happen next is that BA can make representations to the ICO. And in addition, this is what's called a one-stop shop case because um, a number of different EU jurisdictions had people who were on the database. Other EU regulators can chip in and say that the fine should be higher, which is likely, I think, in some cases, or lower which I think is unlikely. So I think we're going to get this um, almost a seesaw effect of some regulators in Europe saying that the fine should be up a bit and BA saying that the fine should be down a bit, or BA could make representations to say that they shouldn't be fined at all. And it seems that it's the latter route that they have chosen. They issued a couple of fairly bullish uh, press statements after the uh, uh, notice of intent became public, and they said they intended to make representations to the information commissioner and seemed to be saying that if she didn't um, uh, listen to those representations, then they would exercise their right of appeal. And you can uh, uh, appeal to specialist tribunals, possibly to the courts, possibly all the way up to the European court, Brexit aside, it gets very complicated if the UK uh, has come out of the EU by the time the appeals heard, because it's likely to be on a point of EU law, particularly around the one-stop shop mechanism. So so that could become truly complex. As we sit here today, though, the uh, fines equivalent to about 1.5% of turnover. I understand that the share price drop was about 2%. And in addition, there is a class action uh, pushing its way through the courts where a firm of class action lawyers uh, represent, they say, 5,500 potential claimants at this stage. And there's a hearing in that case on October 4th in London, which is likely to set out the next steps in the civil action. So all in all, fairly bad news, I think, for BA. Whether the fine uh, takes off or not, I think there's still some turbulent airspace uh, for them ahead. And um, and, and obviously, it's it's the size of the fine that's grabbing people's attention. But there are all sorts of other aspects, I think, for compliance professionals. You know, first of all, you have to know the third parties you're using and make sure that they take proper precautions. Secondly, make sure that you know the software that you're using to gather personal data. Thirdly, I think monitor vulnerabilities in that software. So if you're using you know, WordPress for your website, then you have to know the vulnerabilities there and subscribe to the relevant uh, alerts and make sure that you patch properly, et cetera, et cetera. So BA aren't really being fined for uh, letting thieves close to them. They're being fined, if you like, for not locking the door and keeping valuables inside. And uh, it's important, I think, to get that into context, because I think every organization is vulnerable to that type of regulatory action. 
even if the uh, even if the attempted theft doesn't succeed. Um, so that's it on BA, I think. Do you want me to talk about Marriott as well, Tom? Please, a few minutes left, Jonathan. Yeah, so uh, uh, sort of similar in some respects. There's a uh, smaller notice of intent, uh, but it's still north of 99 million sterling, so uh, 120 million, 125 million US dollar range, I think. Again, a notice of intent, again announced by Marriott to the US Stock Exchange, and it concerns the acquisition of Starwood. They uh, acquired uh, Starwood Hotels, who'd been compromised in 2014. Marriott uh, completed the acquisition in 2016, but didn't discover, they say, the exposure of customer information until 2018. Now, this whole chronology will be interesting to see when we get the reasoning from the ICO, particularly, of course, because GDPR didn't come into effect until May 25th, 2018. So there could be some um, some difficult uh, decisions to be made here on the timeline. And this is a case where I, I think Marriott, again, will be making representations to the ICO. The, the failure, effectively, is not is the lack of due diligence. And obviously, all the compliance professionals on this call will know, compliance professionals have to be front and center in the due diligence process. And if you're acquiring an organization handles data and, the, and where the value turns around data, then clearly you need to take that due diligence really, really seriously. Now, many hotel groups are long since uh, given up uh, owning real estate. They're effectively data businesses. They manage bookings in hotels that other people own and operate. And as a result, I think it, there's an increasing importance on whether data has been lawfully obtained, whether it's being processed lawfully, and that includes whether it's secure. So I think we're going to see a lot of people give rightly uh, more focus to compliance due diligence whenever they're acquiring uh, organizations like this. And then if I've got 30 seconds, I might just mention one other case, which is pretty big news, Tom, and that's our good friend, Max Schrems. So you might recall Max Schrems is the Austrian law student who effectively started proceedings that knocked down Safe Harbor. It was sort of replaced by Privacy Shield. And there's another method of legitimizing the transfer of data called standard contractual clauses. Now, Schrems complained to the Irish Data Protection Regulator, who regulate Facebook, that standard contractual clauses were no better than uh, Safe Harbor and they should be struck out. Some say that the Irish Data Protection Commissioner should have made a decision on that complaint herself. But instead, she, uh, I don't want to use the word concocted, but she arranged for proceedings to be created in the Irish courts, which uh, eventually ended up in the uh, ECJ, uh, the, the European Court, because it's a matter of European law, whether standard contractual clauses are valid or not. And the court have said, that, so the hearing was last week as well, the Court of Reserve Judgment. The uh, court has assistance from somebody called an advocate general who creates a provisional non-binding opinion. The uh, advocate general's opinion, we think, won't be ready until December, which means that the court case won't be decided uh, likely until 2020 now. But that's definitely one that compliance professionals should watch. If standard contractual clauses go and Privacy Shield goes, you're only left with binding corporate rules, and it takes time to apply to get a BCR scheme. So any compliance professional that's involved in data coming out of the EU needs to, needs to be following that case quickly, and, uh, and, and they need to use the time between now and December to consider their strategy if 
privacy shield and standard contractual clauses are nullified by the court. So Matt Kelly, um, obviously the uh, camps on the border are a very large political question these days and human humanitarian issue, but you've been looking at and writing about the camps from the compliance perspective. So I was wondering uh, what your thoughts might be on that. Yeah, sure, Tom. Um, I think, well, I've got a couple of thoughts about Trump risk generally, because we have a couple of different things going on in the news that compliance officers would want to keep an eye on. Um, I had a post not long ago about customs and border protection and the secret Facebook group that uh, roughly Roughly half, a little bit less than half of the 20,000 employees at CPB were in a private Facebook group uh, where they were posting some very nasty, racist, sexist, misogynist comments um, about Democratic politicians, about the migrants whom they were capturing and putting into camps along the border. Uh, very not nice stuff. And I think I, in a roundabout way, I suppose. I like this example because it calls out the uh, threat of subcultures in large corporations. And I think compliance officers worry about cultures and subcultures that contradict your desired corporate culture. Worry about those quite a bit. How do they start? How do they take root? And um, the CPB private Facebook group shows the difficulty of trying to grapple with these because once these groups get on social media, it becomes much easier for them to grow exponentially and exert much more influence to each other exponentially. They really act like big echo chambers. That's exactly what we saw with this group. There were 9,500 people out of 20,000 in the CPB were part of this group, including the director of the CPB, who I think is the acting director at the moment, or she was the previous director because the leadership at these agencies is in total chaos. Um, but it is a fascinating example of the challenges here that these social media vehicles, Facebook group, um, other sort of private social media networks, um, put subcultures on steroids and then compliance functions worried about what do we do to grapple with these? You don't necessarily have a whole lot of choice because, yes, in theory, if people in these groups are posting material that is directly contrary to company policy and does not have anything to do with workplace conditions, sure, you could try to fire them or discipline them. Um, good luck trying to find these private groups if you don't know they exist because they're private. And federal law does allow private Facebook groups where employees might act in concert to talk about workplace conditions. And if you discipline them for material closer to that end of discussion, then you violated the, I think, the National Fair Labor Relations Act, if I remember my acronyms correctly. But um, the very fact-specific stuff that you have to think about for what does this actual post say is it protected speech or not under the labor relations law? And if it is, we can't discipline these people. But if it's not, then we can fire them. But like, it's a mess. And that is just one of the uh, recent examples of Trump risk these days that is um, fermenting or fomenting out in the country. Uh, Tom, I got two other Trump risks uh, from the news, if I could go into those too. So here's what I got. Um, first, I think that we are seeing an increasing rise in the num in the what I would call third party risk where the Trump administration is the third party to your corporation. And this sort of inverts what we usually think of or perceive as who a third party is when compliance officers talk about third parties. Um, usually the first party is you, the company, the second party is the Trump administration enforcing the law on behalf of the public. And the third party is some other group working with your organization that might have violated a law on your behalf. And we all know that third party risk. Um, what we're seeing here lately is this gets inverted. So now the first party is you, your company. The second party is your employees or your customers enforcing their ethical preferences on the company. And the third party 
is the Trump administration that might be your business partner. So what really actually fascinated me lately about Trump risk in the United States these days is the case of that online retailer Wayfair, which is based here in Boston. Um, so this happened several weeks ago. The company was selling bids to the Trump administration. Um, one of their subcontractors for the Trump administration, Wayfair was selling bids to that contractor that was running these migrant detention camps. And the employees did not like this. So they said they wanted the company either to provide those beds at cost or to donate the profit from that contract to Racy's Texas, which is that nonprofit down there that's working to try and uh, represent detained children and document all the privations that they're going through. Um, Wayfair management said, no, they weren't going to do that. So employees staged a walkout. And it happened in downtown Boston, where Wayfair is based. Big, high-profile thing, roughly 2,500 people participating, standing around in Copley Square, which is the heart of downtown, if you know the city. Um, led to a big social media campaign, uh, which I'm sure Wayfair did not welcome, and customers canceling their accounts with Wayfair. So I don't really know how much financial harm or disruption was imposed on Wayfair by this work stoppage and the social media campaign. But I am willing to bet that it cost more than the roughly $85,000 or so that Wayfair was supposedly making in profit from selling beds to the migrant detention camp people. Um, and we've seen that sort of thing before. Last year, Salesforce uh, was under pressure because it was selling software to, I think it was CPB and ICE. Um, most interesting to me last year, I thought one of the big ethics and compliance tales of 2018 was Google employees who forced Google to stop bidding on a Defense Department technology contract. Google employees said, we don't want to work with the Defense Department and we're not going to do it. And Google employees knew that if they don't want to do it, Google can't do it. So Google pulled out of that contract. Um, and I think similarly with Wayfair, you know, I, I saw some uh, right wing people and Trump supporters saying all these Wayfair employees who walked out should be replaced by other people who need their jobs or by the immigrants. What planet are those critics on? Unemployment in Boston is well below two or three percent among technology companies like Wayfair. There's no unemployment. Um, and these are highly skilled employees. So if they say they don't want to do something. Threatening to fire them is not a threat. So you're going to have to deal with this, uh, especially if you are in the technology sector, especially if you are in the consumer sector, where a large portion of this country in the employee base and in the consumer base do not like what the Trump administration does. You don't want to agree with what they think. If you want to be a Trump supporter and you like his politics, that's fine. You're entitled to do that. But the fact remains that a solid majority of America does not like what Donald Trump and his administration are doing. And you have to accommodate that. You have to anticipate that because if you don't, employees and customers will form alliances on social media to cause all sorts of problems to the company. So how will a company try to deal with this? Um, I think that is one of the big issues of 2017, 2018, 2019. Uh, and I'll give you one last example, Tom, that uh, also I thought was interesting. This is more of a internal risk around policies and procedures. It's maybe a bit closer to HR, but this is about employee behaviors and employee behaviors feed into corporate culture. So the question is this, what do you, a large organization, what do you do with strident Trump supporters in your workforce who unnerve or otherwise sort of exhaust other employees? And the example I like from here is uh, a group called Ravelry. So that is an online knitting community. I do not knit. I have just heard about Ravelry. I have friends on Navel Ravelry, but this is a large online knitting community. And um, they adopted a policy last month where they have banned any discussion about Donald Trump and especially any knitting patterns or any commentary you have that is in favor of Donald Trump, Ravelry has now interpreted as a violation of its hate speech code. And you are not welcome on Ravelry. And essentially, I don't know if they're actually deactivating people's accounts, but they have made no bones about it. If you're a Trump supporter, there's the door. Please get out. That's what Ravelry is doing. 
Um, it started because a knitter was posting patterns that uh, had, I think, like build that wall to build a, a weave that saying into a hat or something like that. Uh, somebody reported that as making them uncomfortable. Uh, and that reporter got doxxed because at the time when somebody reported something you said is questionable or in violation of community standards, you could see who that user was. And then the Trump people on Ravelry, uh, the Trump supporters figured out who their real identity was and doxed them. And so this led to this ban of pro Trump sentiment on Ravelry. Um, I think what's interesting here is a content moderator for Ravelry who was a volunteer. She gave a quote to the New York Times or NPR, but she made a fascinating point. She said, quote, there is too much emotional labor involved in dealing with Trump supporters when they are so strident. So Ravelry had to make a call. Would it um, allow this discussion or would it just say the emotional well-being or the emotional labor of our volunteer content moderators is more important. So we're going to side with them and get rid of the Trump people. Uh, so now Trump supporters, I know that they are leaving Ravelry and mass. They have a new knitting website of their own called Humble Acres, I think. Um, but it's a lot like Wayfair, that there are employees who are being told to deal with the Trump administration or strident Trump supporters, and they don't want to do it. And how is a company going to respond to that? And I think what is interesting is that this is only going to get worse of a problem because Donald Trump is only going to play more to his extremist racist base because they are crucial to him get re getting reelected. If he doesn't have the racists and the extremists feeling like he's with them, then he loses. He needs them desperately because the majority of America didn't vote for him before. They're not going to vote for him in the majority again, I would predict. Um, but... If this is what he is fomenting, how are you going to deal with that as a company? If you have employees who are at one of his rallies saying, send her back about black elected officials, what happens when the next morning a bunch of your other black employees say, I saw my coworker saying that at his rally and I'm black and now I feel like I'm in danger? You're going to need to have a solution to that. This is not a thing that's going to go away. And I know it's controversial to talk about the Trump administration and its political views, but folks... This is what's going on, and we can't ignore it. And uh, so that's some of the stuff that I've been thinking about lately, Tom. So, Jonathan, you have a comment for uh, Matt? Yeah, uh, just a, uh, one serious, maybe one less so. Um, I mean, I think we're getting this same sort of trend over here, particularly in debates relating to Brexit. In the news in the UK today, we've a, a Scots lawyer who seem to be trying to promote a campaign over a film about um, uh, Scott's history that's apparently a, a completely terrible film and, and whether that reflects badly on the law firm that he's based with. And I think a lot of people are having to challenge, are having to deal with all of these challenges around uh, extremism, um, uh, at work, aren't they? And uh, and, and yep. in environments like, you know, knitting patterns where you would think would be a, a sane refuge. And I guess my slightly sarcastic comment is that if you're not allowed to mention the Trump word in, in this knitting uh, forum, well, where's he going to get new hair from? <laughs> I, I am sure that there will be other people happy to fabricate any new hair pieces for him. But, you know, Jonathan, he has pulled his hair in public to show that it is the real deal. Well, then I stand corrected. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, on that note, Sarah Haddon, you uh, took over as the editor-in-chief at Corporate Compliance Insights uh, earlier in the year. You've been associated with the site for as long as I can remember, but you weren't the editor-in-chief, and now you're the chief bottle washer, owner, editor-in-chief, and probably <laughs> everything else that needs to be done. And I really have been intrigued and wanted to ask you – um, what have been some of the biggest surprises for you since you took over formally? Yeah, thanks. I'm I'm so glad you asked. I, I first have to say to to Matt though, I do knit. I am on Ravelry, and I would be happy to make some hair for Trump. Probably something pink. 
I'm imagining. Great segment. I really, I really enjoyed your comments there. Thank but you. Tom, I, I appreciate your question here too. Yeah, it's been six months since uh, CCI's founder, Maurice Gilbert, retired as publisher. And it's been four months since we relaunched as an independent source of GRC News. And that's largely been a behind the scenes change. Of course, as the mission of the publication is the same, to provide a forum for informed discussion and a platform for established and emerging voices, as we like to say. But what's been exciting, of course, is how many new voices CCI is connecting with. It seems like every day when I open my email, it's like getting a present. New people reaching out with fresh ideas and innovative solutions for things. People who say, Sarah, I've got this idea, I've got this mission or this story that I want to tell to today's compliance professional and I want to share it with a big global audience, how can you help me do that? So that's been exciting, lots of new contributors in addition to our established writers like you guys who we publish regularly and who have built up big loyal followings who read you and like you and share you from our pages. So that's been, that's been great, but two, I have to stop and look back and I did so just last week. As a matter of fact, I was doing some house cleaning around here. And by that, I mean, I had it in my head that I, I wanted to tidy up the archives and see if some of our older articles needed updating or facelift to some old pages, or maybe we just needed to eliminate some of the old articles to lighten up the database, so to speak. So I did a reverse date search on our content, and I found what is definitely one of the first articles that CCI ever published. And it originally appeared in November of 2009. So this is a decade ago. And the author is Ron Crawl. And the headline is Effective Compliance Programs. And I know I read this piece 10 years ago, but it's not been on my radar really since then. So just for fun, I went into analytics on the site to see what was the last time, rather when was the last time that someone read this article? When was the last time that someone searched our archives, dug deep around and found this, or maybe typed something into a search engine that led them to that page? And as it turns out, this particular article had been read 129 times in the past seven days. So more than 100 times just last week for an article that's 10 years old. I was floored to see that. So, of course, I, I reset my analytics parameters and I ran another report and I found that it has been read 29,879 times since the day it was published. So, by golly, I thought it was probably worth a second look. And I, I gave it a, a quick read before the podcast this morning. I sat down and I read it with my coffee and I can confirm what you already suspect, you know, where I'm going with this since I bring it up. And that is that the messages in this piece are still valid. They are timeless. They are, as we say in the publishing biz, evergreen. And so, of course, I want to share just a, a quick snippet with our li listeners today. This is what Ron had to say to GRC professionals a decade ago. The more complex a compliance program is, the more difficult it is to communicate it to employees and stakeholders. Consultants and professional trade organizations have a field day with all sorts of approaches, frameworks and models on compliance programs. While enterprise software can go a long way towards addressing these inefficiencies, it comes down to the organizational and cultural considerations to ensure an effective program across all significant risk areas. So, yeah, can't argue with that, not in 2009 and not today. It still comes down to culture and to tone at the top. There's so much discussion these days, you know, valuable discussion about the role of technology. We all know how much the compliance professional's job has changed and is changing due to technology, both the kind of technology that creates risk for an organization in the form of cyber threats and whatnot, and the kind of technology that's designed to identify or prevent those risks. But when it all comes down to it, as Ron goes on to say, it's the company's culture. And he concludes the article by suggesting that influencing the culture requires an integrated approach where people and processes and tools and information don't exist or function in silos. We talk about that all the time. So the story's the, story's the same. Different people are telling it. 
And one more note about people in particular. I was also doing some tidying up of the website specific to the authors. I wanted to reorganize uh, reorganize our author database. So I made a category for those that I wouldn't consider active contributors anymore. Uh, the active authors are the ones that are still sending stuff or maybe they're recent or we think they'll return to us. The other half have moved on and, and I would call them dormant. So I removed 700 author names, which seemed like a lot, but I kept 830 and I had to sit and look at that figure on a post-it note for a moment. Combined, that's that's more than 1,500 people who over 10 years have been part of this conversation. And honestly, I don't have much familiarity with trade journals or professional journals in other industry niches, just this one. But that seemed like a big number to me because of the nature of this content. 1,500 people who had something important to say and wanted to share it. 1,500 people who want their peers to be successful. You know, if you're doing your job right as compliance officers, you're not in direct competition with your peers. You're not writing articles that promise to give away sales secrets, for example, or puff pieces that are designed to sell something or create personal branding. It seems like it's the opposite. The sentiments are evergreen. The advice is timely. Everyone's on the same team. We all want the same thing, which is a successful organization that makes the most of the tools that are available today and guided by an ethical culture. So anyway, the names will change. Tools and technologies that we talk about, those will change. The regulatory landscape, who knows? <laughs> These are tumultuous times we live in. But what won't change, I think, is the desire that people like you, and I'm looking right at you around the roundtable, fellas, when I say that, what won't change is that thought leaders like you will take the role of educating and informing and encouraging the next generation of compliance and risk professionals. And with any luck, we will still be doing this 10 years from now. So meanwhile, listeners, you can go look at Ron Crawl's article. And I don't need to give you the link. Just Google effective compliance programs and it'll take you right to it. And maybe bookmark it and read it again from time to time. Thanks for asking, Tom. Michael Volkoff, we had um, an extraordinary release of a document from the Department of Justice's antitrust division entitled Evaluation of Corporate Compliance Programs and Criminal Antitrust Investigations. At one point in your distinguished career, you worked in that division, and I was wondering what thoughts you might have about it for the compliance practitioner. Well, thanks, Tom. First off, uh, one note to Sarah, congratulations. Uh, the site and the work that you do is incredible, and we also owe you uh, to call us all at this roundtable thought leaders. Wow. What a, I mean, either you're delusional or it's a compliment, but I can't <laughs> figure it out which. But that's well, the numbers nice. don't lie. The numbers don't lie. Thanks, Mike. But anyway, um, Tom, I think this was, uh, I think it was uh, another, I mean, we've gotten so much guidance lately. I feel like uh, people better be out there doing something with it, but who knows? Uh, you know, add that to some of the regulatory agencies' guidance that's come out. Uh, but the interesting thing, by the way, uh, just an aside to work in the antitrust division, is when they refer to themselves, they call themselves, you know, we work at the division, the division. Like there's only one, and they're the most important in the world. But uh, I think it's kind of a culture there as well within the Justice Department. They kind of think of themselves as unique. And actually, when it comes to compliance, they were unique in the sense that they had a leniency program uh, from the 1990s that created probably a great model for global enforcement. And um, uh, frankly, if you want to look at what FCPA global enforcement might look like, you should look at the antitrust uh, global enforcement scheme uh, as well, because it's pretty mature. So under the leniency program, what used to happen or what has happened for over 20 years, which has been very, very successful, is that the first person to come in and tell on the other members of a cartel, be it all the other companies, uh, will get immunity, as will uh, all the officers, if they cooperate uh, and tell the truth, they will also get uh, rarely charged, usually get immunity. 
and the company gets a detrebling of damages, which is usually triple damages for um, the inevitable class action lawsuit that comes by of customers, vendors, suppliers, or whoever was harmed by the cartel agreement. And when we talk about cartel, we're talking about price fixing, customer allocation, territorial allocation, uh, and things like that. But what never used to happen in, in the process was that there was much credence given to whatever compliance program was maintained by uh, any company that got involved in this. And usually the retort was, if your compliance program was so good, this wouldn't have happened. You wouldn't have been involved. Um, and so I think what uh, uh, Joe Murphy and many others in the sort of practitioners Joe Murphy from the SCCE had spent a lot of time and effort promoting the idea that there should be some benefit to compliance, uh, some credit given to compliance in the antitrust division. Because usually the first person would get immunity, the second company would plead guilty, get a lesser uh, penalty, and so on down the line with the last person getting the worst deal or no deal or who knows, but paying the most proportionally. And so what has happened now is, and uh, I can just see all the critics of DPAs, deferred prosecution agreements, getting ready to line up because what the government said is if you have now going forward an effective compliance program at the time uh, uh, when you're going to be charged or you're negotiating your deal, if you had one, you will get a benefit, meaning the possibility of a deferred prosecution agreement or even a further reduction in the penalty. And uh, this was a big deal. Uh, it followed a, a symposium that was held about a year ago at which all compliance practitioners got together uh, in terms of antitrust. Now, antitrust has usually been the province of uh, you know, the legal department. And uh, I've always advocated that compliance needs to get more involved for obvious reasons, because it's pretty clear cartel activity is prohibited and you can't do things like reach agreements with competitors. So um, they also issued for the first time a, a detailed guidance document, which follows a lot of the criminal divisions release that occurred in the end of April, which we've all talked about. Um, but, you know, with some flavors towards uh, and some tweaks and some other ideas, uh, including an interesting idea of monitoring your uh, pricing or competitive behavior through statistical uh, programs, and there's a lot of sort of literature on that about trying to detect uh, price fixing or illegal agreements through statistical analysis of your competitive behavior. So that, that was actually injected into this, and so I thought that was kind of interesting. But that's sort of the uh, that's the gist. Uh, to me, it, it means antitrust. Uh, Lawyers within uh, within companies are going to have to um, coordinate more work, uh, with compliance officers, chief compliance officers, and there's going to have to be again a breaking down of silos, which should occur, frankly, in the trade compliance area, antitrust, uh, and bringing it all under the roof of uh, compliance. So we'll see what happens. Anyways, interesting time, interesting document. I urge everybody to take a look at it. Matt, do you have a question for Mike? Well, I, I'm not sure if this is a question or a comment, Mike, and it might even be kind of dumb, but I suppose I'll just say it. Like, I, 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 on one level, I think this is very good stuff. And, you know, anything that Joe Murphy has been advocating for for a long time, I generally fully agree with, and I think it's good news. Um, on the other hand, there are always going to be a lot of cynical people out there who think the Trump administration is trying to pedal back from any sort of corporate enforcement. So there's a bit of uh, intellectual dissonance here in my head about is this a good or a bad thing? But at the end, I'm just like, yeah, this is a great idea. And I, I suppose I'm just looking for a gut check. Like, this is a good thing that we're doing here. Well, I, uh, to be honest with you, I'm more uh, on the, I'm um, I love the advance of compliance. I mean, come on, we all love that to see that. But on the other hand, um, you know, encouraging DPAs in this area to me is pretty difficult because most of the, and I've done a lot of work in criminal conspiracies here in criminal antitrust work. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, I've yet to see one without sort of senior level involvement, senior executives. 
And I just happened to hear, uh, I, I was listening to somebody, a podcast about the Trump administration and white collar enforcement. And the, the numbers are so far down in terms of overall white collar enforcement that it, you know, to be honest with you, Matt, I've been following and sort of focusing on so many of the issues that you were talking about that I haven't even been thinking about the traditional, like, are they really enforcing the law in the white collar area? We we tend to see it narrowly in the FCPA scope, but there's some real questions as to the criminal numbers that are have gone down across the whole Justice Department in the white collar area. And this is going to you know, I don't know how much resistance there was, you know, from the staff in the antitrust division, but I know that they kind of feel like your benefit is, you know, you get a cut, you have to plead guilty, but you get a penalty, uh, you know, reduction if you're the second one in. And, um, you know, why are we giving out more candy when we have the leniency program, which encourages, you know, the first person who walks in gets immunity. And so why are we uh, handing out benefits to the second and maybe even the third? And, you know, this means now there's an extensive review and presentations about your compliance program. And everybody's going to be the defense bar will be saying, well, these were rogue employees. But the problem that I have is antitrust is such an area that is really difficult to have a rogue employee. It usually I just have seen it with senior executives meeting you know, secret meetings in airports, you know, secret meetings, whatever, and and cutting deals. I was involved in one conspiracy, which was uh, two companies got together and they said, look, you, you guys take Asia and we'll take Europe. And they they that's the way they did it. So I, I hear you. I th- I'm more worried about the broader issue, which is, is there really a vigorous, uh, infor- you know, white collar enforcement uh, going on in this administration. Mm-hmm. So, Mike, I can remember when you testified before Congress, and oh one of the God. points that struck me about your testimony way back when was that you advocated a type of a leniency program for FCPA enforcement, uh, drawing, of course, from your experience uh, in the antitrust division, or I guess I should say the division. Um, It seems to me now, though, that the antitrust division has actually gone the other direction and has moved towards um, where the FCPA unit in the fraud section has come out in terms of uh, very strong uh, offers of uh, a declination and discounts on fines and penalties for robust compliance, cooperation and self-disclosure. Would that be a fair assessment? Yeah, that's exactly right. Because they actually amended the justice manual, you know, going back to the FC, the corporate enforcement policy and, and listed the antitrust division there. I, I the, the problem is that does it really work in the context of a leniency program? Um, and, uh, you know, there were leniency ideas in FCPA, but the problem with the leniency program idea was – uh, for the FCPA is is that it's one actor. It's not like you're trying to get five actors and one person to rat out the other four. Here, it's in the FCPA context, it's usually one company with lots of individuals. But we're getting closer to the, eventually, I think we're getting closer and closer in the FCPA area where people are going to get either DPAs, low fines if they turn in all their individuals. Um, that's the trend I see at least, but, uh, I think you're right. And, um, so it's going to be interesting to see, but I, I, what I'm, I'm more, I'm concerned about the sort of aggressive enforcement. And I think leniency is really a different animal in terms of, uh, and very specific to antitrust when you have multiple actors. So, Jay Rosen, uh, in your role as Mr. Monitors, you talk and advocate about the use of monitorships. You help educate on monitorships. But I wanted to ask you, is the monitorship model that uh, you guys at Affiliated Monitors use at the federal level and the state level, does it really work at other governmental levels, such as state commissions, counties, cities, or or even local uh, utility boards and that sort of thing? How would... uh, 
you help someone think through uh, use of a monitor at those levels? Sure. I think, I think it's a great question, Tom, and thanks for asking. Um, most compliance practitioners are aware of the role that monitors play, like you just described. Uh, this audience specifically within the Foreign Corrupt Practice Act enforcement area. However, the use of independent monitors is much broader than simply in criminal or civil enforcement actions involving deferred prosecution agreements, non-prosecution agreements, corporate integrity agreements, or any other form of resolution. Federal agencies, as well as state and local, can use monitors for a wide variety of roles to ensure compliance with agreements. At its most basic level, an independent monitor is a way for the government to extend its reach, both in terms of lengthening out the time of true government oversight and through many of the techniques that we usually talk about, how a monitor can come in and help take a company's temperature by doing focus groups, reviewing documents, talking to senior and middle management. It's very much a cost-effective way for federal, state, and even local governments to extend their reach. This cost effectiveness is driven home by the fact that the cost is not borne by the government entity or the regulators, but rather by the entity being regulated. Recently, affiliated monitors served as an independent monitor on a federal communications, FCC, regulatory matter that ensured the conditions around anti-competitive and other issues were met in exchange for the FCC's approval of the merger between ATT and DirecTV. One of the conditions was that they had to offer a discounted broadband service to certain low-income households. The FCC wanted access to broadband for low-income families, particularly for children in school. The monitor, AMI, assessed the marketing program on that issue, looking at the efforts to provide discounted broadband for low-income housing. Another example of a regulator engaging an independent monitor occurred in a matter where a state regular, a regulator, the Attorney General of Rhode Island, used a monitorship in a hospital conversion matter. In this case, a nonprofit hospital was purchased by a for-profit chain. In such situations, the state Attorney General in most states will have to approve the transfer of assets from a charitable assets to for-profit assets applying certain conditions. It could be in this area of recruiting physicians or requiring acquiring institutions to keep mental health services open. You don't have to spend millions of dollars on new equipment, but the conditions are generally around very specific metrics and are increasingly being used by government agencies as a way of not only having confidence that the regulatory decisions are being followed, but also providing some comfort and confidence to the public, knowing that a monitor is looking over the shoulder of the organization to ensure the public's interest. An independent monitor can also be engaged in non-regulatory areas. One that certainly comes up is pre-acquisition due diligence in the FCPA realm. An independent monitor can be used to assess whether a target or takeover candidate has a robust compliance program. These same concepts also work in the licensing area and pre-acquisition work, and even for a company that wants to test the audit compliance of its customers. The bottom line is that independent monitors can come in and look at a system of controls in a wide variety of regulatory and legal issues. There is no substitute for having somebody independent of the company with expertise, common sense, and practical reality, rea reality coming in and asking, how is this company doing? You don't have to do this all the time. It isn't something you need to do every year, but every once in a while, have somebody come in and take a hard look at how your company's doing and then report back internally. It is money and time well spent because you have now established that the organization being reviewed has a good program. And if you need to fine tune your program in certain ways, you now have a specific roadmap to follow. All right. Well, we are going to move on to rants and or shout outs. So, Mr. Armstrong from the United Kingdom, do you have a rant or a shout out for us? Well, I, I'm spoiled for choice, to be honest. I first of all thought I was going to shout out to the people of Houston for helping the Armstrongs conquer the moon 50 years ago. Um, I then thought I was going to shout out to Chris Grayling. Uh, he's a UK minister who 
who uh, seemingly sort of retires today. Uh, the Guardian newspaper reckons that he single-handedly has lost the UK taxpayer three billion, that's with a B, sterling through his incompetence. It said um, he has a quote, Inspector Clouser levels of genius, and it called one of his decisions uh, an act of extreme stupidity of which no other minister would dare dream. Uh, but in the end, I ended up with the England cricket team. Now, in contrast to you guys, when we have a World Series or World Cup, we invite people from other nations rather than just people from our own backyard. And as some of you will know, it was the Cricket World Cup last weekend and England won. It was a tricky journey to the final and a really close final. And my shout out is sort of to England. But it's mainly to the New Zealand team who lost. Uh, the, the match effectively was drawn twice. And the New Zealand team, to a man, their captain particularly, behaved with extreme dignity having to do interviews just after such a, such a stressful game in such a heated environment. So my shout out ends up to uh, cricket and New Zealand cricket in particular. Mr. Kelly. Yes. So uh, I have a rant against the U.S. Olympic Commission, uh, or I should use its proper new name, the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Commission. Uh, as some of you might have heard lately, and there's a post up on Radical Compliance about this, a Blue Ribbon Commission had just published a report recommending that the Olympic Commission hire a chief compliance officer. Good news. Sad statement that some a group as big as the USOC has not already had one, but whatever. Um, and then this Blue Ribbon Commission gave a raft of proposals to um, improve the U.S. Olympic Commission, which has had many problems overseeing the bodies that oversee amateur sports in the United States. Uh, the worst of them, of course, being USA Gymnastics, which turned a blind eye to Larry Nasser and his abuse of hundreds of gymnasts for 20 years. And USA Gymnastics and the USOC, like they screwed it up and missed all of that for too long. So here comes this Blue Ribbon Commission, the Borders Commission, offering a bunch of reform proposals, including hiring a chief compliance officer. And they threw in this, that perhaps the USOPC should revisit its mission statement and possibly even its code of conduct. And so as I was writing my post, I went to link to the USOC's code of conduct because, foolish me, I thought, how hard could it be to find that code of conduct? Well, I can now tell you how hard it is. Um, it took me, going from their homepage, teamusa.org, it took me six clicks to figure out where the code of conduct is. And that is only because I have been doing this a long time. And I know that if all else fails, you might search at the bottom in the tiny print and you might look at governance and you might look at legal within that. And then finally, six clicks later, you get to the code of conduct. That is my rant. It should not be that hard for any organization to for someone to find your code of conduct, uh, especially if you are as um, in poor reputation as the USOC is. And if it's hard enough for me to find it when I really know what I'm doing and how to find it, imagine how hard it would, might be for a confused 17-year-old uh, athlete who might have been abused by his or her coach trying to figure out what to do, or an employee who is trying to figure out what is right or wrong, and they have to navigate all of that. Um, that is... That is wrong. If it takes six clicks to get from your homepage to your code of conduct, that is at least four clicks too many. Um, so that is my rant that the USOC should, you know, among the many other reforms that you guys have to do, put your code of conduct link in clear, easy to find place right on the homepage. And I think everybody else should do that. But of all organizations, the Olympic Committee really needs to get its act together on that. Sarah Haddon. I have a shout out today to everyone who's doing more with less. And of course, that's everybody. We're all short on time and resources and our own efforts can only get us so far, which is why collaboration and partnership are so important. The best way to multiply your efforts, I think, is to have your message amplified 
by someone else. So I want to do that to um, for a scrappy group of politically savvy women who happen to be video production professionals. They're script writers, camera operators, production assistants. This is a, a small, diverse, talented group of filmmakers, and they're donating their talents to make high-quality campaign videos for down-ballot candidates who are committed to gun safety legislation. Their goal is to lower the cost of running for office for people who have the political courage to fight the rising toll of gun deaths in America. And because you can do more when you have more, I am happy to give them a shout out. They are one vote at a time, one vote at a time.us, and you can make a donation right on their site. So that's my shout out today. Michael Volkov. Uh, quick shout out uh, to our host, uh, Tom Fox, for his, uh, I had the honor of attending a Greater Houston Business Ethics Roundtable meeting called Gerber. Uh, if anyone wants a model for a local program uh, like that of compliance officers and support, it's a great program, well run, uh, uh, and uh, just a, a great model for other cities or regions uh, to follow. So kudos to you, Tom. Great group of people and really enjoyed uh, seeing everybody. Thank you. Jay Rosen. So um, this is, I guess, a shout out. Um, while I enjoy listening to everybody who's on this assembled podcast, to your webinars, to your podcast, to your teaching, um, many of you know that I'm a big fan of Preet Bharara, who's the former uh, AUSA in the Southern District of New York. And uh, yesterday in his podcast, he uh, interviewed George Will, the conservative columnist, and pre observed that he said to George Will, uh, you once said the following about your father that I found an interesting quote, quote, there is no moral power like that of quiet example and none more vivid to me than my father's, end quote. And Preet asked, why is the quiet example morally more powerful than any other way to model behavior? And Will answers, quote, just watch what I do, not what I say, end quote. It's because it's in bleak and indirect, and as for that reason, more effective, I think. So that quote made me think about my dad uh, 13 years ago in 2006. Uh, he passed away much too quickly. And not a day goes by when I don't feel his message in my mind and his goodness in my heart. So here's to you, Dad. And I'm going to add a shout out because uh, earlier this week, one of my favorite uh, authors died, Andrea Camarelli, who is the author of the Inspector Montalbano, Montalbano novels, uh, murder mysteries that took place in Sicily. Uh, not only are they some of the best uh, murder mysteries I've read, but he became a published author at the age of 69. So for anyone out there who's ever wanted to write a book and uh, didn't have the courage or didn't think you had it in you, um, and you're not 69, there's still room for you. So uh, they were great books. I've enjoyed them, and uh, I hope you will as well. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of Everything Compliance. I've listed uh, everyone's contact information on the show notes if you want to follow up with any information or questions, rather, about any of the information they presented to uh, to us in this podcast. I hope you'll join us again in two weeks where we have another episode. The Everything Compliance Gang is Mike Volkoff, Sarah Haddon, Matt Kelly, Jay Rosen, and Jonathan Armstrong. This is Tom Fox. Thanks for listening, and I hope you will tune back in. Everything Compliance is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network and a proud member of C-Suite Radio.